Wow, that was amazing. Uh, how do you follow something like that? All right. Um, hi, uh, if you don't know me, my name is Rocky and I am the youth pastor here at First United Methodist. And uh, right now there, there's a, a lot of discussion going on uh, among uh, United Methodist churches in the Clinton area. And, and we're, we're in many ways uh, rebuilding old ties and in, in, in many ways rethinking um, how we as United Methodists do church in the Clinton area. And so there's, there's a lot of ideas right now. There's nothing really set in stone. It's just, we're just sort of in, in the, the beginning stages of, of brainstorming and, and dreaming and thinking about possibilities. And um, it's a really exciting time to be uh, a part of the United Methodists here in Clinton. And so a, as part of this rethinking of, of maybe how exactly we do church, um, I thought it would be good uh, to talk about um, what is church and, and to sort of help flesh that out because I think, um, at least for myself, I know growing up I, I had a lot of uh, presuppositions and assumptions about what church was and it wasn't until I got a little bit older that I realized maybe, maybe some of those weren't very accurate. Um, so if you have your Bibles with you, uh, turn with me to Matthew chapter 16. I don't know if it's going to be on the screen or not. It is. Um, but if, if you have, it's still, if you have it with you, um, go ahead and turn there because, because it's, it's always good to be able to see it and then you can reference back to it. And, um, this is, this is um, in talking about the church and, and what the church is, I think that this is an important passage to, to begin with. Um, in, in biblical interpretation uh, studies, there, there are certain principles you follow to make sure that you, you are you're interpreting scripture correctly. Uh, and one principle that is often used in biblical interpretation is called the law of first mention. Meaning that if there is a word in scripture that you want to know what it means, it's helpful to go back to the first time that that word is mentioned in scripture and begin with that as your definition of what the word means. And then from then on, you, you just apply that definition unless a biblical author gives you, gives you a different understanding of what the word means. This is, this passage of chapter 16 of Matthew verses 13 through 19 is the first time in the New Testament that the word church Ecclesia in Greek is actually used. And so it's helpful to come back to this passage to understand what exactly is this thing that we call church. So I'll just read beginning in, in verse 13. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist and others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Pray with me. Father, um, I pray that you would speak through me. I pray that your word, your, your wisdom, your teachings um, would become alive and, and have an impact on us. I pray that our hearts and our minds would be open to you. And I pray that, that we would really glean truth from this and not just truth as in something that we think about, but truth as in something that changes how we live. Be so active and evident in this service this morning. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. One of the, the important points of, of this passage is in verse 18. Um, Jesus says, 
He says to him, after, after Peter gives his confession, Jesus says, I, I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And a lot of people have asked, well, what is this rock that Jesus is claiming to build his church on? And, and historically, there have been two, ex, two major schools of thought in this. Uh, the first is kind of the, the understanding that the Catholic Church tends to hold to. The, the word Peter in the Greek is Petros, and the word rock in the Greek is Petra. And so there's this play on words where J Jesus says, uh, I say to you that you are Petros, and upon this Petra I will build my church. And so um, throughout much of church history, people have kind of uh, thought that, well, this, this rock that Jesus is building his church on must be Peter um, because of the play on words there. And so because of that, the Catholic Church believes that Peter, being the first pope, um, had special authority that was passed down through the papacy. And so the rock that the, the, uh, the church is founded on is um, the authority of, of the pope. And so that's why, um, that's why the pope has so much uh, influence and say so and authority in the Catholic Church. But we're Protestants. And, and Protestants don't, don't follow the authority of the Pope, um, and, and I think for, for good reason. Um, that's just my thought. Uh, so Protestants have a different understanding of this passage traditionally. Um, and, and we've kind of had to, in the 16th century when the Protestants were sort of breaking away from, from Catholic tradition and authority, they kind of had to come up with a different understanding of this passage because you can't, you can't break away from the authority of the papacy if you believe that that is the foundation for the church. So there's a different explanation that says, um, this is most often in Protestant churches, that the rock that Jesus is talking about, the Petra that he is building his church on, is not Peter, but Peter's confession. Um, in, the, in the verse before, or yeah, in two verses before, where G Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And so it's not Peter himself, but, but the words that he spoke, that confession, that P Protestants often say, well, that, that is the rock on which the church is founded, is the confession of Christ as Lord. This is what I believed for the longest time, but over the past few years, I've come to, to not accept that, that explanation because as much as I'd like to believe that, um, as much as that helps me, helps sort of validate me as a Protestant, it doesn't make, that explanation doesn't make very good use of a very obvious play on words that Jesus has here. Um, if, if he's only talking about the confession, it would be strange for him to first mention Peter as the Petros and then say that he would build his church on the Petra. It, it disregards that. Dr. Tony Evans um, kind of, uh, I was listening to a sermon that he did and um, which really kind of helped explain this passage to me. And uh, if you know who Dr. Tony Evans is, he's a really great communicator, really smart guy. And uh, he has a book out called Oneness Embraced, where he talks um, about, mostly it's about uh, racial reconciliation within the church. But he, he sort of talks about this idea that I'm going to get into. And I kind of want us to go back through the passage and, and to look at it bit by bit. So that's why I said, get your Bible out. Um, because I want to I point some things out in here that maybe we've kind of overlooked. So Matthew chapter 16, beginning in verse 13. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, plural, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they, plural, said, some say John the Baptist, and others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, plural, but who do you? And, and we can't see it in the English, but in the Greek, that word you is plural. So if he were from the south, it'd be, who do y'all say that I am? 
Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, Jesus is asking the question of the group. He, he is with his disciples. He asks his disciples the question. Simon Peter is merely answering on behalf of the group. Um, a lot of scholars believe that because, um, because the apostles were, uh, when they went to the temple, the, ap the apostles didn't pay the temple tax, only Simon Peter and Jesus did. And in, in Jewish culture, if you were 20 years old or over, you paid the temple tax. So a lot of scholars think that most of the disciples were probably very young, maybe, maybe teenagers, um, which, which explains how John could write his gospel so much later, how he lived that long. Um, and so a lot, a, lot of, um, a lot of people think of it as in Jesus had a youth group and he had one youth leader, Peter, because Peter was older. And Peter, he was kind of the sort of youth leader that puts his foot in his mouth every now and then. Um, but in this case, it's the youth leader, his, his adult volunteer, who's sort of speaking on behalf of the group. Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jona, or Simon, son of Jonah, uh, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven, I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. In classical Greek, now the, the Bible was written in Koine Greek, in classical Greek being more um, Socrates and, and Plato and them. Um, in classical Greek, a petros, which is the word that, that is used for Peter, a petros is a stone. Um, Simon, the name Simon, means pebble. So Jesus says, you are a stone. In essence, you've grown up. You, you've come to a new understanding that God has revealed to you. So he says, I also say to you that you are Peter, a stone. Now in classical Greek, Petra meant a rock, like, um, like a, a larger collection of stones, like, like a, a cliff face or, or many stones that have been hewn together. Um, so it, it's, it's this idea that you are a stone, Peter, and on this larger collection of stones, I will build my church. Because as much as we sort of miss this, I don't think Jesus forgot that the rest of the group was still there. I think he, was, he began talking to a group of people, and when Peter speaks up on behalf of the group, Jesus didn't be like, oh, forget you guys, I'm going to talk to Peter. I think that he's still addressing the group as a whole. I, I also say to you that you are Petros, a stone, and upon this Petra, this rock, this collection of stones, I will build my church. And I think that this is the same idea that Peter himself uses in his first epistle. Um, in 1 Peter chapter 2, he talks about Jesus as being uh, the stone that, that the builders rejected. But then in verse 5 of chapter 2, he said, in talking to the church, he says, You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. The idea of several stones built into one thing. And, and the word that he uses there in his letter for stone is lathos, which is a, a large, heavy stone that has been put in place for a reason and requires much effort to move. It's the same word that the gospel writers use when talking about the stone that was rolled in front of Jesus' tomb. So we, as um, living stones which are in place for a reason and should require a lot of effort to move, that our convictions should be strong, are being built up into one solid unit, one rock, one household. And on this unit, this collection of stones, Christ builds his church. So 
The conclusion being that we are the church. I am not the church. Pastor Bob is not the church. Dennis is not the church. Y'all, y'all are the church. We all are the church. It's not the people who are paid to work in the church office. It's anybody who confesses Christ as the Messiah, the Son of the living God. You are now one of the stones who's part of the greater rock. And if you want a really great, a really great word or picture of what, how exactly his apostles would have seen this when Jesus first said it, talk to Pastor Bob. He was actually at the place where uh, Jesus talked about it, and, and it's really kind of cool to hear he, what he says about the landscape there. We are the church, and, and though. We say this, and though I'm sure most of us have heard this at some time or another, the implications of this are huge, and a lot of times we overlook them. That it is not our job as people staffed by the church to, to do what the church does. We, we are merely, we are merely, it's convenient sometimes, it's advantageous, to hire somebody to, to devote their full time to doing church things. Um, but we are not the church. We all are the church. You are just as much a stone in this greater rock as I am or Bob or Dennis. So now that we understand that, that it's, it's not a single confession or a single person, but it is a collection of stones on which Christ built his church, I want to talk about the word that he uses for church. And this is the Greek word ekklesia. And it, me it comes from the Greek word kaleo, which means to call. Um, so ekklesia is the called out ones. And this is, this is a, a Greek term because in ancient Greek city-states, um, they had this ecclesia, this assembly of, of called out ones. And what that was, was these were citizens of the, of the city, not, not necessarily um, the rich or, or the politically powerful. It was, it was a collection uh, a, or a selection of citizens from the city states who were, were called out at an appointed time to come together and have legislative authority over the city-state to create, to make decisions for the city-state and the surrounding area. This is the word that the Gospels use when they talk about the church. That we, as a collection of stones, we as one solid unified rock, are to have legislative authority in the spiritual realm so as to have a very big impact in the world. Does that make sense? It's up to us to have an impact in the world. It's us. We should be, we should be the rudder that is causing the ship to, of history to move. We are the ecclesia, and the ecclesia should have authority. Now, I'm not talking about necessarily like political authority but I'm talking about spiritual authority. And, and Jesus sort of points this out because right after he says, you are Peter, a stone, and upon this rock, I will build my church, my ecclesia, and the gates of Hades, or hell, will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth, whatever you bring together on earth, shall have been bound or brought together in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth, whatever you untie on earth, shall have been loosed or untied in heaven. You see, we are to have authority in the heavenly realms. It's up to us to change the world around us. And there's the, this strange idea in churches that we are always waiting on God. And sometimes I think it's very much true that God is waiting on us. 
because we, we, it's like we want something to happen and so we pray and then we're waiting for some sort of miracle or road to Damascus experience before we'll act. When God says, I've given you authority, I've given you the keys to heaven, I'm waiting on you to do something. And so that's, that's where it, it, the onus of responsibility lies not solely but very heavily on us to, to knock down hell's gates. And it, it's a really great um, indicator of whether or not we're being the church, the second part of verse 18. He says, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell or Hades will not overpower it. A good question to ask then is when you look at the world around you, when you look at your workplace or, or you look at your schools, uh, your social groups or your clubs, um, when, when we look at our city, when we look at Clinton and the surrounding area, um, when we look at Iowa or, or Illinois or the, the world as a whole, when we look at, at elementary schools and we look at marathons in Boston, when we look at fertilizer plants in Texas, and we look at, at poverty, in, in third world countries and we look at conflicts in the Middle East. When we look at our world, church, who's winning? It, is it the church? Or is it hell? And I think, while not always, I think if we're going to be honest with ourselves here, in a lot of ways, hell is winning. In a lot of lives, hell is winning. So the question is, what are you doing about it, church? What are we doing about it? It's not, it's not we come to church. This is not, this building, though we often call it church, this building is not the church. Um, for the first 300 years or so of Christian history, they didn't have buildings called churches. It wasn't until Emperor Constantine came along and he gave, he gave political power and he gave money to the church so that they could build larger buildings of worship that people started associated the word, associating the word church with a building. Prior to that, it was very well understood that a building is not the church. The church is not a place. The church is a people. The church is a collection of stones hewn together into a spiritual household. We are the church. And it's up to us to determine the future. It's up to us to have spiritual authority to make an impact on the world around us. It's up to us, it's up to me, it's up to you, it's up to us to knock down hell's gates. And so we can't be idle. We can't sit here and be in church on, for an hour or an hour and a half on Sunday morning. It's up to us to be the church everywhere we go. Every time we see a hurt, every time we see a need, every time hell starts winning, it's up to us, church, to fight back and to knock those gates down. So this is something I want us to think about. And, and, and I don't want you to just think about it now, but I want, I want this to sit in the pit of your stomach and bother you into action just like it's done for me and just like it still continues to do for me. I want, I want the fact that there are places where hell is winning in our world, I want that to, to be unnerving because that should not be if the church is being the church. And so think about this. Think about how this affects your life. Think about how this affects our congregation and what we should be doing. And, and even as we, we talk about working with other United Methodist congregations in the area. And, and think about 
how the church should be on a broader, even more universal scale. Because we are church. And you and I are church. And so we need to be doing something about it. Go ahead and stand up. I don't have anything really clever or, or spiritual or beautiful to say, but my, my challenge to you, my, my commission to you, not just to you, to y'all, but to we all, to us, is let's, let's stop talking about going to church or having a church, and let's start living like we're being the church.